This video is sponsored by Professional Photographers of America. Join a community of over 34,000 photographers and find equipment insurance, education, and business tools made specifically for small business owners like us. Welcome back everyone. You might have noticed that things look a little different here and if you've been following my Instagram stories, you know why. And that's because about three weeks ago, I moved into a new studio and I've been spending a lot of time getting it ready and putting everything in the right place and also building the setback here, which is what we're going to talk about in today's video. I'm going to go through the entire process of building it from scratch. And then at the end of the video, I'm going to show you two different lighting setups when I use it for the very first time with our model Abina. Now, this is something that I've wanted to do for a number of years, and I think my desire to do it started in 2004 when I watched the movie The Aviator, starring Leonardo DiCaprio and telling the life story of Howard Hughes. In this scene with Alan Alda where he's eating lunch, I love the wood paneling on the wall, and of course, the movie is just shot beautifully as well. And then in this other scene where he's going to uh, wash his hands in, in the restroom, I love the green color on the wall. Now, in my head, I conflated these two scenes together and sort of came up with the idea that he was in a dining room with Alan Alda that was completely green with a lot of molding on the wall. And so I've wanted to do that, uh, a scene like this ever since. If you haven't seen the movie, it is a great film and I love the way that it's shot, including this sequence here in the restroom. A lot of the images are just really uh, brilliant and quite enjoyable. So I've wanted to create this scene for a number of years. And the reason why I formed an L back here with two walls coming together in a corner is because I wanted maximum flexibility. I've seen a lot of people shoot with only a flat wall or build a set with a flat wall. And by the way, this was my first time ever building a set. And I sort of took together the 10 years of DIY home decorating that I've done and put it together in, into this um, into this uh, set that I'm going to be using for a number of years. So the reason why I built a corner is because I wanted to be able to shoot it from different angles. I can go all the way to camera right and all the way to camera left so that you can barely see the other wall, just a hint of it, or I can shoot it right up the middle and everywhere in between so that you can clearly see that it's a corner. And the design should allow for me to sort of envelop models in the scene or at least make it appear that they're in a green uh, ornate room. And I think it's gonna be a lot of fun to work with over the next few years. So this project took me several days uh, to complete, but I think you could complete it probably in about uh, two days and maybe four to five hours over the course of those days. The reason why it took me a little longer is because I was giving longer times for adhesives to dry and also going on a trip and doing other things around the studio. So just know that that's the sort of time investment that you're looking at here. And speaking of investment, let's talk about all the materials that I use to make this setback here. And so you can see them now on screen. There were a lot of them. I will link to everything in the description below, but just know that everything cost me $573.77 with tax. So it isn't terribly expensive and it isn't terribly cheap, but it is something that I think is gonna deliver a lot of value over the next few years. And I think maybe annually I can paint it and probably a new color and probably get away um, with having this uh, in my repertoire for a while. So I think it definitely will be worth my time. So a few months ago, I visited my photographer friend Kenda and she showed me how she took some molding pieces from Wayfair and attached them to a V-flat, World V-flat, and then instantly made what she likes to refer to as Hotel Kenda, a very cool sort of ornate wall that she can drop into any scene in her studio. And so I wanted to use molding pieces that were like that in order to create my setback here. And so she sent me a direct link to those molding pieces, which are these sort of, I believe they call them scalloped 
squares, and I ended up using 12 of them back here. But I searched over all of Wayfair and looked at everything they had to offer, and I actually found that these were, in fact, the best option out there. So I got eight of the large ones to put on the top half and four of the smaller ones to put on the bottom half. And of course, I'll link to those and everything else in the description below. As well from Wayfair, I also purchased the chair rail, which is sort of the uh, divider that you see here in the middle of the wall. And then on the very bottom of the wall, I decided that I was going to get some molding just from Home Depot and go with that, figuring that it wouldn't be that prominent in the picture. And I didn't really find anything on Wayfair that I necessarily liked. I probably could have bought the chair rail at Home Depot too, or a similar store like Lowe's, but I ended up getting it from Wayfair. So that's how I sort of went about it. Now, the wall paneling that I used is just this smooth surface that's four by eight feet per panel, or 1.2 by 2.4 meters. And I got those at Menards, which is sort of a Midwest competitor, Home Depot, but I'm sure you could find something similar. I just went with this smooth white surface because I thought it would be extremely easy to paint and would give me an instant drywall sort of looking wall without a lot of effort. The only thing that I might regret is that there is a visible seam in the large square wall, but I don't think it'll be very hard to Photoshop and a lot of times the subjects will probably be standing in front of it. So I don't think it's that big a deal. Before we move on, I wanted to tell you about a nonprofit organization that I use in my photography business, which you've all heard me talk about. And that's PPA, Professional Photographers of America. Today I want to highlight something for you that you may not know about yet. And that's PPA's Indemnification Trust. I know what you're thinking. What's that? Sounds complicated. Well, this coverage is designed specifically for photographers and helps you with data loss recovery services and even your legal fees if you have an unhappy client. I hope I never have to use it, but if I do, I know PPA has got my back. All I have to do is file a claim and boom, help is on the way. Assistance ranges from advice on handling matters to direct intervention and offsetting certain costs or losses. One of the most experienced law firms in the world when it comes to helping photographers is standing by to help PPA members. For a low monthly fee, you receive a variety of unbeatable benefits with your membership, including up to $15,000 worth of equipment insurance, education, and customizable contracts. Follow the link in the description for a special discount on your membership. Whether you're just starting out or you've been at this a while, PPA can be a lifesaver for photographers through its indemnification trust. Originally, I planned on gluing the molding pieces from Wayfair onto the 4x8s and then sort of joining them together with some L brackets or something similar that I bought at Home Depot and then leaning everything up against the wall and the shelves that I have back there. However, my husband talked me into building a frame for the set and I think that was the right choice. Most of our walls here in the United States are built out of two by fours, but because this isn't a load bearing wall or even a real wall, I decided that I could get by with two by twos. And I think that was the right choice. So all of those pieces of lumber were two by two inches by eight feet. And because our lumber system here is sort of a lie, those two by twos are actually one and a half inch by one and a half inch by eight feet. So in metric, that would be about four centimeters by four centimeters by 2.4 meters. Now, because I was using three, four by eight foot or 1.2 by 2.4 meter panels, uh, wall panels, one here on the small side, and then two on the square side, I knew that I wanted to create a 2.4 by 2.4 meter or eight by eight foot frame for one of them. And then I wanted to create a four foot by eight foot frame or 1.2 by 2.4 meter frame for the smaller wall. And so to do that, I wanted to make as few cuts as possible. So I came up with this schematic or this plan. So if you look at the blue lines here, those are whole pieces of lumber. I didn't cut them at all. So that seemed to be a really great idea. And so then for the square wall here, I just cut five studs to go in between there. And because the pieces of lumber at the top and the bottom are one and a half inches thick, that meant that each one of my studs needed to be 
um, 95 inches in length. So just three inches shorter than they come, you know, from the lumber mill. Then on my side wall here, what I ended up doing was keeping the eight foot pieces of lumber for my outer vertical columns. Then I used a piece on the top and bottom that was 46 and a half inches wide. The reason why I did this is because I wanted my frame to be one and a half inches wider than my wall panel so that I could attach the two panels together in the corner. The smaller wall would overlap the larger wall. I did, however, make one mistake, and that was that there was nowhere to mount the wall panel on the right side of my frame. So I took scrap pieces of wood that I got from making all of my other cuts and attached that to the frame in order to give myself anchor points for the wall panel. So I thought using this sort of configuration would give me the best stability or yeah, perhaps stability, or it would just be the easiest overall. I'd have to make fewer cuts and it would probably go together neater. So to glue or adhere the wall paneling to the frame, I actually used a combination of screws and an adhesive. So this Liquid Nails product is capable of working on wood and plastic. And the molding that I got from Wayfair was plastic. So this seemed like the right choice. So what I did was use a caulk gun and get this adhesive over the sides or the edges of the frame where the 4x8s were going to be attached. I then went to put the 4x8 panels on top and that's when I noticed that I had a little problem. It turns out that my square wall, the 8x8 foot wall, wasn't exactly square. It was a little bit of a parallelogram. And so if I lined the panels up to the side, then there was sort of a weird diagonal at the bottom and things didn't really line up. I decided that lining them up and gluing them to the side was probably the best course at this point and that if things were off on the bottom that was going to be okay because I was going to cover the bottom of the wall up with molding later and so things would just work out. So I went ahead and proceeded uh, with this. I could have avoided this entire problem had I just bought these metal brackets from Home Depot and that would have sort of facilitated me getting the wall more square hopefully um, but you never know. When I went to go assemble the smaller wall, I found that it was actually square and I glued the molding on top. Because I was going to have molding all over this wall, in locations where I knew that molding would exist, like the baseboard, I could put screws in to secure the panel there and that worked out just fine. The same thing for the chair rail and then higher up on the wall. To further make sure that the panel adhered to the frame, I used sandbags and apple boxes to weigh it down. Then I let the whole thing sit for several days while I was out of town teaching a workshop. And when I came back, I started working on the project again. During the course of my trip, I came up with a solution for my parallelogram problem. So if I lined the wall up so that the corner matched up correctly, what I was gonna have from your perspective right now is the bottom was gonna slope upwards. So the best way for me to counteract that was just to put some blocks of wood at the bottom. And I put one in the far side and I put another one in the middle. And I did that using some scraps of wood that I had from a previous uh, project that I did around the house. And basically it was a half inch in the middle because I measured that each panel was off by a half inch. So those two together equaled one inch. Um, I put a half inch block in the middle and a one inch block on the end. And that worked out pretty well uh, for getting things, you know, together to be level. So then with the help of my husband, I put the two panels together using uh, temporarily using this bracket, um, one at the bottom and one at the top. Then what I did was I measured where the bottom line of each piece of trim should be and I drew a line across the surface of the wall so that I then could do my next step. Well, before that actually, we then, after drawing all the lines, we disassembled the wall and laid it flat. And I started putting my trim on. So I had to uh, take those long pieces of molding and I had to cut them so that I could form the corner. And I did that with my circular saw. And then I lined up all of the pieces of of all those squares from Wayfair and I glued them to the surface of the 4x8s. I didn't put the baseboard on during this step because I wanted to do it sort of at the end of the process. 
This time I felt like I needed a lot more weights to keep those down because I could see that they were off a little bit. And so I ended up using everything possible from the studio from apple boxes to real apple boxes to uh, sandbags to gear cases to the bins that I keep all of my hardware in, everything that I could find possible to weigh them down. And then I let it sit overnight. The next morning I came in and I started painting with this medium grade Glidden flat wall paint. And it's actually perennial green in the bare line of paints, but bare paint is more expensive than Glidden paint. So I thought this would be the way to go. The reason why I picked this particular shade is because it was slightly darker and in the same hue as these green chairs that you see back here. I bought these green chairs for my last studio for clients to sit in and I used them for props a few times, but not really. And I also enjoyed lounging on them myself, but I also just wanted to have a place for them or a show place for them in this new studio. So I think um, that's gonna work out really well and create some nice tone on tone sort of looks. And the reason I wanted a matte finish was because I didn't want any reflections in my shots. I just wanted to keep everything nice and matte, just like the makeup I usually use on people. If you want to learn about that, I guess I could link to it too, but a matte finish is really probably the way to go overall. I realized right away that I probably made another mistake and that was that I didn't paint before gluing the molding pieces on the wall. The reason for that is because the roller brush that I was using could only get so close to the molding and then I had to paint those mostly by hand. And so that just was a little difficult. And there's a lot of corners and nooks and crannies and edges that were there. And I think things would have went smoother had I just painted the panels and then painted the molding pieces. I think also had I used a more expensive paint, maybe if I bought the $30 paint, um, I only used a one gallon bucket, by the way, and I probably used about three quarters of it. Um, if I used the more expensive Glidden paint, then maybe it would have been easier to get it on there, but as it was, it took two coats and it didn't look that great. Maybe if I used the bare paint, it would have went on there easier as well. Or maybe if I used some sort of paint sprayer, it could have been a better choice. But in any way, I got the job done, or at least I got it pretty well done, and I let the paint dry. And then I actually went and bought a car. I've been through a lot lately. While I was on another trip, my husband rear-ended another car and totaled my 10-year-old car. He was fine, everyone was fine. It's just the car, maybe the other car, <laughs> didn't make it. So I had to move. Uh, so in the course of the last month, I moved out of my old studio. I um, had to put everything in my garage in order to, because there wasn't, the studio wasn't quite yet available. I had to seal these concrete floors. <laughs> then I had to move in and get everything situated. Then I had to go buy a car. And also I had to go on two trips to teach two workshops during that whole period of time. So it was a lot, but anyway, I went and I bought the car and then my husband and I had dinner. We came back and we started to assemble the wall. We moved the pieces pretty much into their final resting place, if you will. And then I went back there and screwed the panels into the bracket. I also attached some bumpers, these silicone bumpers to the top of the wall so that if it came in contact with anything, that it wouldn't be putting a dent or a scratch in it. So just to protect the paint on the drywall that's back there. Then we scooted it back into position. Now I came across another mistake. So the chair rail on the four by eight wall was going down a little bit and not exactly high enough in the corner where the two pieces come together. So I ended up popping it off the wall and thankfully this adhesive is good, but it's not that great. And I was able to really easily, you know, not, not too hard, but I used the screwdriver and I pried it off of there. And then I moved it up a little, put some more glue there, nailed it into place and everything was fine. I might've ended up using a screw a time or two to get the molding back in, but I used it in a place where it wasn't gonna show. 
I took over a four by eight piece of flooring that I'm gonna use permanently on the set. I took that and I put it up against the wall and then I grabbed my molding pieces, which I already painted for the baseboard and I put them into uh, position. And then I just tap those in there using some finishing nails and a hammer. Then I had to touch up the paint on the wall. And believe it or not, it took me three rounds of touching up the paint to get it looking fairly good. Maybe I'm not the best painter. Maybe it isn't the best paint. Maybe plastic molding's hard to paint or something, but that's how things ended up going down. Then I went ahead and dressed the set by adding in my two four by eight sheets of wall paneling that are gonna become my flooring. If you'd like to learn why it is that I use these four by eight sheets of wall paneling for my flooring or floor drops, as people always ask me, they'll be like, what do you use for your floor drop? That thing looks interesting. Well, it's just plain wall paneling that people probably use in their basement, but more on that in a video that I will link to. So then I added my green chairs to the set. It looked fairly good and I was ready to shoot. In fact, I had a shoot lined up for the very next day. All right, so now that we've got the set built and we've got Abina here, let's talk about the lighting. So I'm gonna light her from the front with this beauty dish. That's gonna be my main light. Then I'm gonna fill her with this large Octabox that's back here. This is an Elinchrome 190 centimeter indirect Octabox or 75 inches. This is a 70 centimeter or 28 inch white beauty dish. Then to separate her from the background and give some detail to her hair, I'm gonna be using this one by three foot, I think it's 35 by 100 centimeter strip box. So let's talk about the brightness of each light. So I want the beauty dish to meter a little brighter than my f-stop. So I'm gonna be shooting at f8, so that means I want this one to meter around F8 and a half or F8 and two thirds. So I'm gonna fire it here with my Sekonic L478 DRUEL light meter. That's a mouthful. And we'll see how bright it is. So it's at F8 and four tenths. I'm just gonna turn it up a little bit there. Then I'm gonna meter again. Okay, great. So I'm at F8 and seven tenths. Now I want the fill light. I'm gonna fire that one alone too. I want the fill light to be around F2. So let me just meter here. Okay, great, that came in at two and five tenths. I'm just gonna turn it down a little bit here. Okay, great. And then for my hair light, I'm gonna want that to meter around F8 and a third. Let me check that out. Perfect. All right, now that we've got a great shot here with our loop lighting, I wanna switch things out and put a large strip softbox out here boomed over the set. That should give me some nice short lighting on her face and it should also sort of sculpt out her entire body. I'm gonna remove the beauty dish and I'm gonna remove the hair light. We're gonna go with just that strip box and the fill and I think that should give us a pretty good look. All right, so I've got the large indirect strip here over the set and it's creating some really great light on a beano. So the light from the main light is reading at F8 and 7 tenths, and I'm shooting at F8, and the light from the fill light, it's metering at F4. So about a two and two thirds stop difference between the two lights. I'll go ahead right now and show you just this light by itself and then the fill light. So looking here at just the main light by itself, you'll see that it's sort of creating a key light and almost like an edge light as it's creating some highlights here across the top of her body. And then of course the fill light is coming in and filling in those shadows and allowing us to see into the background, creating some separation there between the bottom of her hair and the wall. So one of the key things you wanna consider with the placement of the main light is that you want it to be about six inches to a foot. That's about, um, that's about 15 to 30 centimeters in front of the subject, towards the camera. The reason is, is that when the subject is too far back and too far away from this light, it's just a key light. When she got sort of under it more, I noticed that I was getting that key and that rim light at the first, at the same time. So that's just something to think about. And if I were to sort of stand here and draw a direct line from me through her body, the strip softbox, is just about one foot, 30 centimeters to the right of that, give or take. 
somewhere in there between six inches and a foot or 15 and 30 centimeters. All right, thank you guys so much for watching this entire video. Making this set was a lot of fun and I was really glad that I got to try it out here for the first time today. Remember to click on the link in the description to get a special discount on your PPA membership. And if you wanna watch a video that YouTube thinks you'll love, click on this one up here. And if you wanna watch a video that's about building a set that I did a few years ago, click on this one. Thank you guys so much for watching. Stay safe, have a great day, and I'll talk to you soon.